Good morning. If you've got your Bible with you, be opening up to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, that is where we're going to find a beginning place for our study together this morning. John, are my, are my charts in, in the slideshow? Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Let's start here. There's a phrase that Jesus uses here in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. We're not going to stay here a whole long time. I mean in Revelation 2. We're going to stay here a long time. No. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 where Jesus says this. Do not fear what some of you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days, but be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Perhaps you've heard that statement made a lot. I know I have. Be faithful unto death. What does that mean, though? What does faithfulness mean? When Jesus uses that term and encourages us to be faithful like he did here, uh, the church at Smyrna, what does faithfulness look like? What does faithfulness embrace? What does God expect from us when he calls us to be faithful? Those are the kinds of things we want to look at this morning. We want to see what faithful is, how the New Testament uses that word. And then we want to kind of paint a picture for ourselves using the New Testament as to what faithfulness actually looks like. So let's begin just by talking about this word faithful and talk about what faithfulness looks like. Faithful means reliable or trustworthy, true to one's word. It means steady in allegiance. It implies qualities of stability and dependability and devotion. Just basically when we think of faithfulness, what are we thinking of? stick to Maybe that's a word we've heard before. The idea of being dedicated to something, the idea of to seeing something through. That's what faithfulness is all about. Think about faithfulness in the New Testament with me. Uh, come over to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew chapter 25 and in verse 21, faithfulness embraces the, the idea of stewardship. Right, we're over here in Matthew 25. We've got the story here of the parable of the talents, right? Verse 14, a man is about to go on a journey, calls his servants to him, gives them talents according to their abilities. To one five, to another two, to another one. He goes on a journey. He comes back and expects to receive back his own with interest. And so, in verse 19, those servants came and settled accounts. And the one who had received the five talents, this is verse 20, came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, you good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The one who had received the two talents in verse 22. Master, you entrusted to me two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of your master. The idea of stewardship here. Stewardship is the idea that you've been entrusted with something and you're using it as though it doesn't belong to you but that it belongs to somebody else. And you have to make the best use of that. Uh, it's a similar idea that we see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul would simply say this, in this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found Faithful. 
dedicated, reliable. All of these ideas fit into our notion of stewardship and faithfulness. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Faithfulness in the New Testament embraces the concept of finishing. Faithfulness embraces the idea of finishing. It's not simply how we begin. It's how we end, right? Faithfulness begins, but faithfulness also sees what has begun unto the end. As we talk about God here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24, not ourselves, but God. God is faithful who calls us, and He also will bring it to pass. Faithfulness is not simply about starting something. Faithfulness is about seeing what has started all the way to its conclusion. Here we can rest confidently in the God that we serve. He has started a good work in us. He will bring it to completion. To, to completion. He will bring it to completion. The idea in the New Testament here, He is going to... Take care of us. I'm not doing that. That is the machine. So, just shut it down and I'm just going to preach this morning. Okay? So, it embraces the concept of stewardship, the idea of finishing. As we've seen, it's a quality of our Heavenly Father. We see that here in 1 Thessalonians 5. Do you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13? No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is what? God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with every temptation provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear. God is faithful. And so when we talk about being godly people and displaying godliness within ourselves, if God is faithful, it's incumbent upon us then to be faithful as well. It's a quality of our Heavenly Father. It ought to be a quality that we possess within ourselves. And it's a quality of Jesus. Look at Revelation chapter 1. We begin in Revelation chapter 2, but look at Revelation chapter 1. As John is introducing this letter, he says in verse 4, To the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who were before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. The faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and who gave himself for us, released us from our sins by his blood. The faithful witness. The idea of someone whose testimony can be trusted and believed. It's a quality of our Father in heaven. It's a quality of Jesus. It's related just to that basic idea of faith, the idea there of dedication. But when God is speaking to us in the New Testament about faithfulness, He's talking to us about the degree to which our faith in Christ moves us. There's the connection between faith and faithfulness. The faith that we have, the degree to which it moves us and molds us and makes us into the people that God wants us to be, that's where faith meets faithfulness. I can possess faith and not be a very faithful person. I can believe in Jesus. I can accept Jesus. I can go through the motions. But if it doesn't move me to conform my life to who Jesus is, I'm not really a very faithful person, am I? And so here what we want to do in our time that remains is we want to paint a picture of what faithfulness looks like. That when God talks to us in his word about faithfulness, what does that look like in practical terms? If I want to be a faithful person, what do I do? How do I live? If it's A to B to C to D, what are those steps? What does faithfulness actually look like? If you've got your New Testament, open up to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's start here. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 
1 Timothy chapter 1, and let's start over here in verse 12. What does faithfulness actually look like? And as we try to paint this picture, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, here's what Paul would say. I think Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful. Here's our word. He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason I found mercy in order that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. He started that though by talking about faithfulness in verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful. How was Paul faithful? Well, let's look at the text here. He was faithful in that he was serving, verse 12. Faithfulness looks like service. It looks like humble service. L look at Paul's attitude. I'm doing this service, verse 15, because I was the foremost of all sinners, verse 16, and yet found mercy. If I realize the depth of my sin and the amazing grace that we talked about last week of God and how that changes us and redeems us and frees us from sin, shouldn't that move me on to live a different life? Paul says it did for him. He considered me faithful and put me into service. Faithfulness embraces humble service to God. And it involves thanks. The grace of our Lord, which was more than abundant. And for this reason I found mercy in order that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Paul says, I'm the example. I'm the example of what a faithful God can do. Here's my background. Here's my life. Here's all of the awful things that I did, verse 13, and God saved me from that. And because of his grace, put me into his service. And if he can use me, Paul says, to Timothy and to us, he can use us too. If God could find a use for Paul, God can find a use for any of us. Look at Acts chapter 14. Look at Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, here we are on the missionary journeys. We're bringing it to a close. And in verse 21, Luke says, After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lustra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples and encouraging them to continue in the faith. Urging them to do what? To continue in the faith. That sounds a lot like faithfulness to me, doesn't it to you? Urging them to continue in the faith, saying, Through many tribulations we must enter into the kingdom of God of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Making an entry into God's kingdom my priority, that's what faithfulness looks like. So here's the message that they're sharing with these disciples. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Can you imagine that? We're starting out the gospel, starting out the church, and we're going to all of these different cities. We're sharing the gospel message, and this is the thrust of the message that Paul is sharing. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. 
You think that's a message that was going to fill up the church house? Talking about tribulations, talking about hardships, and talking about the need to endure. We're bringing all of these tribulations on ourselves, Paul. If we just give up the gospel, this hardship isn't there. But what would Paul say? What did he say in 1 Timothy? It's worth it. This isn't just some exercise in futility, some exercise in self-mutilation or something like that. This is about living a designated way for a purpose because I recognize there is value and meaning in it. Because it's worth my time. It's worth my attention. It's worth all that I could put into it. What had happened here? Go back into, go back into chapter 13. Go back into chapter 13, look at verse 15. The Jews stirred up the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city, and they instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they drove them out of their district. Well, we keep on going back and we see more and more of these hardships and difficulties that Paul and Barnabas and the Christians are facing. That they're being kicked out of city after city. Their message is being rejected. They're being mocked by those who are in power. And yet Paul continues. And not only does he continue, but as we're looking at what's going on here in the New Testament, the church is growing. Even from Acts 2 over to Acts 5, when we start to have this initial persecution of Christians, the church is growing, growing by some at least 2,000 people between Acts 2 and Acts 5. What is there that would make us willing to suffer? Could I submit to you it's just exactly what Paul says here in Acts chapter 14? It's the faith. They were to continue earnestly and steadfastly in the faith. The faith, as you look there at chapter 14 and verse 23, the faith that had come to them through the message that was preached, through the Lord that had been preached to them by Paul and others of the apostles. Not some better felt than told experience, not, not some mystical happening that some in the crowd got and some didn't get and some really wanted to experience it, but they didn't get to experience it. No. Here was faith that came to them through their choice to participate in the message that was preached. And to folks who had made that choice to continue in that message that was preached, Paul said in verse 22, don't give up. You've started something good, but here's what faith requires, not just to start, but to finish. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Here's the test of faithfulness. Or worded a different way, here's the test of whether or not faith has actually taken root in our lives. Are we willing to endure difficulty? Are we willing to face down hardship? Because let's be honest, here's what we see sometimes. Sometimes what we see is not so much of the faithfulness preacher don't don't get on that faithfulness and don't talk about this and don't talk about that but we can talk about faith right we can talk about believing in jesus we can talk about repenting we can talk about confessing we can talk about being baptized all those things are good we can we can talk about those things but oh don't you start talking about giving don't start talking about coming to church definitely don't start talking about coming to church being on time don't talk about those things. Don't talk about that faith. Talk about faith, and we'll make the applications about faithfulness to ourselves. We don't need you to do that. Thanks. But listen to how Paul said it there in Acts chapter 14. As he is talking about faithfulness, he talks about faithfulness, not using that term faithfulness, but using the root of faithfulness, which is what? Faith. 
continue in the faith. Here's the question. The question is not how faithful am I. The question is, has my faith taken root within me? And if faith has not come into my heart, if I have allowed faith, faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the gospel, faith in God, to come into my life, take hold of my heart, and to change me and to move me, you're right, we don't need to talk about faithfulness. Because there's something we've got to talk about first, and it's letting God's Word have steady course in our lives. So what would Paul say? We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God, and thus we would continue in the faith. That's what faith looks like. That's what faithfulness looks like. Making entering God's kingdom and participating in that kingdom a priority in my life. And while we're talking about participating in the kingdom, go back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. Now for the 18 seconds that it was up there on the screen, do you remember how we define faithfulness? Dependability, reliability, devotion, right? Those ideas. Trustworthiness, steady in allegiance, dependable, stick to You come to Acts chapter 2, the very beginnings of the New Testament church. And Paul's Gospels are, Paul, Peter's Gospels, Paul's not on the scene yet. Peter's Gospel sermon continues longer than what we have recorded here, with many other words, verse 40 tells us, that he testified to them and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And in verse 41, Luke notes, Then those who had received his word were baptized. Word of God took hold in their lives. They had what? Faith. And they were baptized. That day about 3,000 souls were joined together. But notice in verse 42 what they did. What did people of faith do? This gets us a picture of faithfulness by looking at what people of faith did. And not just did, but as you look at verse 42, what they did continually, what they did steadfastly, what they did with reliability, right? This isn't something that was a one-off adventure for them. What they did often, what they did continually. I'm convinced that what's being described here in chapter 2 and verse 42 is the worship of the New Testament church. You disagree with me, that's fine. We can talk about it sometime later. But that's the approach we're taking right now. What did people of faith do? They continued steadfastly. That's our idea of faithfulness, isn't it? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and in fellowship, which I think contextually here is talking about their sharing amongst themselves financially, the breaking of the bread, reference to the Lord's Supper there, and to prayer. We might today call that worship. The worship of the local church. Here's what faithful people did. They came together and they honored God. How much? How often? When? Text would tell us they did it continually they did it steadfastly they did it with reliability I don't know what does that communicate to you I tell you what it doesn't communicate to me it doesn't communicate to me that this was just something that they did by sheer happenstance nor does it communicate to me that this is something they just did when they felt like it be honest and you don't have to raise your hands but just mentally raise your hand 
There ever been a time you didn't feel like coming to the assembly? Preacher's going to say yes. Maybe that makes some of you comfortable to say, okay, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe so. There have been some times I didn't feel like it. But then in those moments like that, I realize, you know what? I look at passages like Acts 2.42. I look at passages like Hebrews 10. And I arrive at this conclusion. It's not all about me. I don't feel like it sometimes, but it's not all about me. I look out this morning and I see some faces in here of people who quite frankly probably have every excuse in the world not to be here but that are here because they know it's not all about them and they're here to honor God and they're here to encourage their brethren and I look out and I see those people and that's an encouragement to me the ones who I know that are sitting in a pew hurting the ones who are going through mental anguish the ones who sit around and see families together and wonder and worry about why their family can't be together like that. I appreciate that. That's not something that goes unnoticed or unappreciated. And it's the very spirit of what we're talking about this morning. Now notice... I'm not trying to make attendance at assemblies be the end-all, be-all of Christianity. It's not. There's a whole lot more to Christianity than being at every assembly when the doors are open. But let me ask you this. If faith has taken root in my heart, and my brethren are coming together to honor God and to support one another, Where am I going to be? Just answer that. Where am I going to be? What does faithfulness look like? Faithfulness looks like honoring God with my brethren. That's what the early church did. They continued steadfastly in these things. They were faithful in these things. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Here's what faithfulness looks like. Faithfulness looks like confidence. You ever heard somebody say Christianity is just a crutch? Just a crutch you need to support yourself? Number one... The people that I hear that from are also the people that tend to be the PC police. And describing Christianity as a crutch and equating it with disability and saying that's a bad thing really doesn't fit the whole PC mantra, but that's another discussion for another time. If I need a crutch, so be it. But let me tell you what Christianity really does. Let me show you what faith really does, what faithfulness really does. It gives confidence. It's not, Christianity is, is not to be this, this, this kind of weak-willed existence that we see amongst so many people. I don't really know whether God really loves me and appreciates me or not. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is about boldness. Christianity is about confidence. Listen to Paul here in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the what? I've kept the faith. What does that mean? He was what? Faithful. And being faithful gave him what? Confidence. 
Confidence in what? Verse 8. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all of those who have loved his appearing. Paul says, I have confidence because of my faith in Jesus Christ and because of my continuance in that faith that there is something better waiting me beyond this life, and I have no doubts about it whatsoever. And it's mine, and it's not only mine, it's for everyone who looks to Jesus. That's what faithfulness looks like. Faithfulness looks like absolute confidence even in the most trying of circumstances, even staring down death itself. There's a whole lot of reasons why we might not embrace death. You remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul didn't say don't sorrow. He says what? Don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We have a varied reaction to death, and that's fine. The Lord understands that, provides for it even. But we can face down death. We can stare it down. And in the face of death, we can even overcome. Overcome with the absolute confidence that there's something better on the other side. What does faithfulness look like? It looks like humbly dedicating myself to God. It looks like making entering God's kingdom a priority in my life. It looks like honoring God with my brethren. Faithfulness looks like confidence in the face of challenge. But then think about this. Faithfulness looks like somebody who was honored and remembered, not by the greats in society, but by the widows. Remember the story of Dorcas in Acts chapter 9? Who remembered her? Who honored her at her death? Who made great mourning and lamentation because she died? It was the widows. Not the highest of society, not the most honorable, not the most noteworthy in society. That's what faithfulness looks like. I don't have to be great in culture. I don't have to be great in society to be faithful and to be remembered by the right people. That's what faithfulness looks like. Faithfulness looks like someone with literal skeletons in his closet. That's still in Acts 9. That's Paul, isn't it? We talk about having skeletons in our closets. I doubt too many of us have the literal skeletons in our closets like Paul did. But he was able to overcome that, wasn't he? And if he's able to overcome that, you think we can overcome the skeletons in our closets? I think so. You look at the the list that Paul lays down there in 2 Corinthians. But all of the different hardships and difficulties that he suffered. Faithfulness looks like somebody who is marginalized and beaten and scarred. Can you imagine what Paul looked like when he would walk into an assembly of the local church? I'm going to bet you dollars to donuts that it doesn't look like that precious moments caricature in the Bible that we give our kids. Paul's walking in there beaten and scarred, but victorious. That's what faithfulness looks like. Faithfulness looks like somebody from a divided home. That's 2 Timothy chapter 1 in Timothy, isn't it? We read about the faith of his grandmother. We read about the faith of his mother. We read nothing about his father. Absolutely nothing. But that's what faithfulness looks like. And if Timothy can come to know the Lord and to serve him from a divided home, I think I can too. I know I can. And while we're on the topic, 
Faithfulness looks like somebody who's struggling to raise children in that divided home. Which is just exactly what Eunice was doing there in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And then you look at Hebrews 12 and we see Jesus. Had an older preacher tell me one time that your outline's not finished until you can get from point A to Jesus. Well, let's get to Jesus. Look at Hebrews 12. Here's what faithfulness looks like. Faithfulness looks like somebody who was mocked and who was rejected and yet who overcame. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, that's going back to stories that we read in Hebrews chapter 11. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. The mocked and rejected Savior who has now sat down at God's right hand, he's the one to fix our eyes on. The one who was faithful to death and who calls to us to live the same life. Maybe it is you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, turned to Him to take away your sins and washed in the waters of baptism to have your sins taken away. If you haven't done that, that opportunity is yours this morning. Right behind these curtains, I found this out not too long ago, there's a baptistry. If you're ready to come to Jesus Christ this morning and to put him on in baptism, we're ready to help you. But maybe as a Christian, you're looking at your life and you're seeing the word of God and you're realizing that you haven't let that faith take root in your life and make you into the person that God wants you to be. We're here for you too. And we would love to do nothing more this morning than to sit with you, to pray with you, and to encourage you. If we can help you, in any way, come to the Lord this morning. Would you let us know by coming while we stand and while we sing?